know Jesus is here. Hallelujah. Come on, give Jesus a good welcome. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We don't we we celebrate Jesus, right? Amen. Even Chicago. Amen. The Bears, the Cubs, and whatever. And I tell him, I said, look, you better, you better scream louder for Jesus, amen, than any other sport team, any other, you know, superstar, amen, because he is our superstar, amen. He is our everything. Why don't you take your hands and raise them right now. Just ask God to speak to your heart. Prepare your heart. Father, we love you. We worship you. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor in this place. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, Lord. Minister to each and every one of us. Help me now, Lord God, communicate and articulate your word, this word that you've given to me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Al, for the opportunity to be able to come. Amen. We always all follow you as well. Amen. And we always uh, look and see what God is doing and there's tremendous things that are taking place. And I wish I had more time to share with you. We just got back from uh, Amsterdam and Germany and then Chicago. But uh, maybe another, maybe tonight we can give a little report. Amen. And, uh, but it's been, it, God is moving all over the world, all over the world. Victory Outreach is on the move. And how many know that we're in a very uh, significant time in our ministry once again? It's a new season, right? It's a whole new season. Our conference is coming up. Amen. We're excited about our world conference, and we know that God is, is, is moving the ministry. He's setting the stage. He's getting things. Jesus, there we go. Praise the Lord. I kind of look at how, how, how the, there's a chess game. The, the world is, is, is the board, and, and, and Victory Outreach is all over, and God is making his move. It's all over. He's making his move, getting ready to, amen, to 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 take out, amen, and to conquer the world for Jesus, amen? And so it's exciting to see what God is doing. So I know that even here, I, even here, I know that how many of you have a promise, right? You have a church promise, amen. You, I know every one of you have a promise. And I know that God is getting ready to take you into another encounter, and amen, another experience, another dimension. How many feel that in your church, right? I hear you're tearing down the walls, amen, getting things ready for growth and expansion, amen? And how many know that growth and expansion can only happen if we continue to grow and we continue to enlarge our capacity, amen, of what God wants to do in us and through us. And, and that's what this is all about. That's why we come to church. God, get us his word and get ready to see what God has for us. And, and I think it's happening all over the outreach, all over Victory Outreach. God is getting ready to take us into our promise and not only now for our children, but our children's children. And we're excited about that third wave revival, amen, that's taking place, that's, that is taking place already, amen, here in Victory Outreach. So I, this morning, I want you to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn them to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 14. Numbers 14. And here, again, it's very familiar, I'm sure, to many of you, but God had, had delivered his people, brought them out of their struggle, out of Egypt, and took them through the way of the wilderness, amen, to get them ready for their promise, get them ready to, to take them into another encounter, another experience, amen, with God, what God had planned for them, what God had promised for them, and they've come to the brink of the promised land, brink of the promised land, getting ready to step in. But before they do that, Moses does something, and he, he chooses 12 spies to send them out to spy out the land to see if it's everything that God had said it was. Amen. They went out. They came back. We'll look at that in just a moment. But here now, you know, uh, they're getting ready to, to step in. God is getting ready to take them into another encounter, another experience, a whole new level. How many are ready for another level? Yeah. Amen. A whole other level, amen, of an encounter, an experience with Almighty God. And then this is what happened. Are you ready? Verse 1. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, or in other words, to kill us? That our wives and our children should be victims? 
would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the congregation and of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephthah, who were among those who had spied out the, the land, tore their clothes and spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, Listen, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the law, in other words, the promise is good. Amen. If the Lord delights in us, and if not, in other words, if God loves us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread, and their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us, and do not fear them. In other words... The opportunity, the window of opportunity is now. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, I want to title this message, The Tale of Two Attitudes. The Tale of Two Attitudes. Having the right attitude for growth and for success. I don't think that there's anybody here this morning that ever started out in life or started out in a marriage or started out a business or started out, uh, you know, in ministry that wants to fail. Amen? I believe each and every one of us want to succeed, and you should want to succeed because that's what God wants us to do. And God put his seed in us to be successful, to be productive and fruitful in whatever we put our hands to do. And most important is for us to find and to identify what is God's plan and what is God's purpose for our life. There's no better place or safer place a person can be than in the perfect will of God. Amen. And so this is where God's will and God's plan and purpose was to take him on the other side into the promised land. That's what he promised him. Amen. And so they came and they, they, they started to go in, but then something happened. And what happened was, and we'll see in just a moment, amen, that, that they went out and they spied out the land, but 10 of the spies came back with a negative report. It was Caleb and Joshua, the ones that stayed positive, amen, and had the right attitude in order to be able to see great things by God. Amen? amen. Now, the tale of two attitudes, okay? Now, attitude is important. If we're going to succeed, if we're going to accomplish the plans and purposes of God, if we're going to see the glory of God, amen, you got to have the right attitude. Amen. Now, in the past, we might have been, you know, we, you know, negative or, you know, nothing ever went our way or whatever. But that was our own fault. <laughs> Amen. But sometimes we have a tendency to carry that into Christianity, carry it into our relationship with God, that on our journey with God, carrying that excess baggage. And let me tell you something. If we don't learn how to change that attitude, it's going to keep us from growing, keep us from excelling, keep us from moving forward and stepping into our promise. Amen. And seeing the successes that God has designed and, and planned for our life. Chuck Swindoll wrote in, in his book, one of his books, he said this. The remarkable thing about human beings is this, is that we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change the past. We cannot change the fact that people will act a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is learn to play on the one string we have left, and that is our attitude. <laughs> Amen? Sometimes that's all you have. And listen, you choose what kind of attitude you're going to wake up and have today. Amen? Amen? It's your choice. We can blame this and blame that and why we're frustrated and why we're mad and why we're kicking the cat and kicking the dog and, and you know, doing all kinds. Or you can choose. You can choose that this is a day that the Lord has made and I'll be glad in it and I'm going to continue to move forward and do God's plan and purpose for my life. Amen. So I don't know who may have came in here this morning, maybe heavily burdened as we were talking this morning. Some of you may be facing some difficult situations or circumstances in your life. Maybe it's your job, your business, your family, your marriage, or maybe some personal illness. And perhaps it doesn't seem like there's any light at the end of the tunnel. And about the only thing you can do this morning, as we have just heard, is play on the one string you have left. And that is your attitude. 
And if you are the type of person that has gone through some stuff, then you got to learn how to play it well. Amen. That way you can grow and you can move forward and be successful and step into your promise. Somebody say amen. Because it's important that we understand that we are where we are and what we are largely because of the dominating attitudes that occupy our mind. Let me say that again. We are where we are and what we are largely because of the dominating attitudes that occupy our mind. Listen, if we allow negative circumstances to control us, our attitude, it, we might as well turn off the lights and go home. Party's over. We, we're not going to go nowhere. We're never going to move forward. We're not going to grow. We're not going to excel. And we're not going to see the beautiful plans of God become a reality. Amen? So how many are ready to move forward? See, this is why I want to talk to you this morning, having that right attitude for growth and success. Now, let me begin, let me begin by this. Let me share with you two truths about circumstances. Is that all right? Two truths about circumstance. First of all, number one, the first truth is that negative circumstances are a part of life. Always remember that. I mean, things happen. Amen. Things happen. One day I, I came back from out of Europe, Chicago, and then back home again. And I get home and all of a sudden the toilet is leaking and, and the refrigerator went on the blink and, and uh, uh, the grass is dead. And, you know, I mean, all kinds of different things. I, and even when I went to the restroom, I seen the leak. I, even though I did say, oh, lying devil. <laughs> but I know it wasn't the devil. Amen. Things just happen, right? Sometimes you're going to get a flat tire. Sometimes you're going to get off on the wrong off ramp. Amen. Things are going to have negative circumstances are just a part of life. And I'm continually amazed at the number of people who believe that somehow they ought to be exempt from negative things. Somehow they ought to be exempt from pain or difficulty that may come their way living in this fallen world. Amen. Because we live in this fallen world, how many know that, listen, sometimes life just ain't going to be fair. People are not always going to do what they say. People are not always going to be nice. Things are not always going to go as planned. It's just a part of life. And sometimes you may even feel like, man, I got the short end of the stick. Well, there's going to be times you did and you will get the short end of the stick. But I, I see it this way. You got two choices. Either you can sit around and whine about it all day and accomplish nothing in your life or you can deal with it. I said you can deal with it. And Victory Outreach, we have learned in our ministry to learn how to deal with it because God has a purpose and plan for our life. And we ain't just here having church. We got a world to win. We got a city to reach. Amen. We ain't got time to be moping around and whining and neg about negative things. Somebody say amen. See, it all has to do with attitude. The second truth about circumstances is that good circumstances does not guarantee true happiness. Again, I'm amazed at how many people fall into the trap of believing that somehow the grass may just be greener on the other side. Some people say, standing at the fence, looking at all that green grass, if only... If only I had a better job. If only I had a bigger house. If only my wife wouldn't would be act different. Amen. Or my husband would was a certain way. If only I had more money in my pocket. If only I had better clothes. If only I drove a nicer car. Boy, I'd be happy or happier. And somehow we feel that the grass is greener on the other side. But I heard someone say this some time ago. Some time ago if the grass is greener on the other side, be careful. Because it might just be that it's growing over a septic tank. Lord, have mercy. But you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Because think about it. How many know people who have made it to the top of the social economic ladder? who live in big houses, drive nice cars, who are successful and have a whole lot of green grass, but they're not happy. They're still miserable. They're still unfulfilled with their life. Amen? Because the truth is good circumstances does not guarantee true happiness. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you not to change your situation or to change your, your circumstances. But 
What I'm trying to say is that if we would spend more time trying to change what's on the inside, Rather than spending so much time trying to change what's on the outside, let me tell you something. You'll be a lot, have a lot more peace, amen, and a better attitude, amen, and things will begin to happen. Can you say amen? Because the fact is, let me give you a heavy truth right now. Are you ready for it? Write this down. Because the fact is, wherever you go, there you are. Right? I mean, could it be that everybody at, at that church is wrong, and that church is wrong, and that church is wrong, or that home is wrong, and that home is wrong, or that job, is, the people at that job is wrong, and that people at that job is wrong, and that, that they all have the same thing to say? Could it be the problem may be not what's on the outside around you, but what's on the inside? That's why you got to always remember, wherever you go, there you are. How many of you ever heard the statement, you can take the lion out of the jungle, but you, can you take the, lion, the jungle out of the lion, right? It's like they used to, when I was a kid, they used to try, you know, because I was messing around, you know, and they think, we got to get him out of here. And they would send me up north, they met with my uncle somewhere who was a prison guard somewhere. They sent me up north, and no matter where you go, you're going to find <laughs> trouble, Amen. Amen. I found trouble, sure enough. Amen. Because you can take the homeboy out of the neighborhood, but you can't take the neighborhood out of the homeboy, right? Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus has the power to do that. Only Jesus has the power to change. This is why you got to learn how to focus what's on the inside, because wherever you go, there you are. How many know you can take a person with a negative attitude and put them in the best surroundings and circumstances? And they will still find a way to be unhappy. They'll still find a way to complain about something and still find something negative. Because it's not what's on the outside, but it's what's on the inside. The tale of two attitudes. Having the right attitude for growth and success. Amen? And here's the point. If we want to grow and we want to move forward and we want to experience that growth and success and fulfillment that God intended for every one of us to experience then we're going to have to stop being so negative because God's going to do something. God's moving. Amen. This church is moving. Amen. We're going somewhere. The ministry's moving. Amen. And listen, the worst thing you want to do is get left behind because of that stinking attitude. Amen. <laughs> so get in with us. Amen. Let's get a hold of God and let's change our perspective. Amen. And let's move forward and experience everything of God's promise that he has for your life. Amen. Somebody give God a praise. So in order to do that, you got to have some stuff inside of you. Turn to your neighbor and ask him, you got the stuff? Come on. Now, it is in this passage of scripture that we find two men, Caleb and Joshua, who had the right stuff inside of them. Faith, character, fortitude, attitude. Somehow they were able to maintain a positive attitude while being surrounded by a multitude of negative people with negative attitudes and negative situations. See, it had been two years after God had miraculously delivered the nation of, of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. And now it was time for them to enter their promise. Moses sent out 12 spies to go spy out the land and then return and give a report. When they returned, Moses gathered the whole assembly together, amen, to hear the report of the spies. Then Moses asked, give us a report. One stands up and says, truly, it is a magnificent land, a land that flows with milk and honey. Okay, that's good. But then all of a sudden, somebody else stands up and says, but the people there are very powerful, and they're not going to leave without a fight. Then another stands up and says, and it's not going to be easy because the cities are well fortified and guarded, and you should see them. They are giants compared to us. And what's worse, there are more of them than there is of us. One after another, a negative report. They started positive, but then after that, negative after negative after negative. You, at that point, you could imagine what happens. The whole, that whole negative spirit begin to infect that whole congregation. That's the power of negativity. But then Caleb stands up, and he said, wait a minute, hold up, time out. He takes charge and he, he, he gets time out and then he says this, let us go up at once 
and possess the land, for we are more than able to conquer it. Let us go up in one. This is what I love about Caleb. Now, what I love about Caleb is this. He doesn't stand up and, and, and try and deny the report. He don't stand up and try and deny the reality of the situation. That it wasn't going to be an easy fight. But in spite of the facts, in spite of the report, in spite of the reality, he still stands up and says, let us go at once. For we are more than able. We are more than able, amen, to take possession of the land. The land. You know why? Because he had the right stuff inside of him. He had the right attitude. So the story then picks up in chapter 14 where we read. And here's the question. Why was Caleb and Joshua so positive, so positive when everyone else was so negative? What did they have inside of them? Well, first of all, let me show you some keys. First of all, number one, the first key is this. The first key is that, listen, they were certain. They were certain of, of, of God's love for their lives, that God loved them. Listen carefully, because if you remember what, what, the, what the complainer said, they said, did the Lord bring us all this way to fall by the sword and kill us? See, that was their perspective. That was their attitude because of the negative situation. They felt that God brought them this far to leave them. That God brought them all this way to kill them. And therefore, they, that's because of their perspective towards God that affected their attitude. Listen, make no mistake about it. Your ability to be positive is directly related to how you see God and how you believe him. I've always said this. How one believes will determine how one behaves. Amen. If you see God, you know, like a God, like when I was a kid, amen, you know, I got traumatized by my grandma. Amen. You know, when you're a little kid, you know, running around getting into all kinds of stuff, right? You go to grandma's house, and all of a sudden, grandma cornered me one day, cornered me. Boy, I'm just a little kid. I didn't even know about God, amen? And, he, and she cornered me and says, I've been telling you, you better behave, man, because you know what? God, God's going to punish you if you keep on doing Whoa, I said, whoa. And that stayed in my mind. And I started growing up as a kid. Every time I got in trouble or something happened, I said, oh, man, God is punishing me. Because how you see God will determine, amen, how you believe about him and how you behave. If you believe that God is against you, and this happens a lot of times sometimes in our ministry because of the backgrounds that we came from, amen, because of our past, amen. If you think that God is against you and that every negative situation or difficult circumstance or, or difficult person that you come across will always make you feel that God is against you or punishing you, it's wrong. Because if that's the way you see God and that's the way you feel, then every, listen, then your attitude and your response to life and people will be negative. It will be negative. Just like those in the Bible. You'll be saying, well, if God really loved me, and if God really cared, then why are all these negative things happening to me? Why does God let them happen? Huh? God doesn't love me. Huh? How many times we've heard that? How many times did that probably cross our minds? Well, if God really cared, then why did this happen? If God really loved me, then why did he allow this to happen? Isn't God in control? Why did he let this happen to me? Why did he bring me this far to leave me? Why did he even get started in this thing? How many know the devil is a liar? I'll tell you this. Listen, you know, if a person ever wants proof, listen carefully, proof of God's love, don't look at your circumstances, don't look at your situation, and don't look at negative people, my friend. If you want proof of the love of God, that God loves you and God is with you, amen, then listen. I like the way the apostle Paul puts it to the first century church in Rome. He listened to what he says in Romans 8, 35, 36. Out of the living Bible, he says this. Listen carefully. He says, who can ever keep Christ's love from us? When we have trouble or calamity or when we are hunted down or destroyed, is it because he doesn't love us anymore? And if we are hungry or penniless or in danger or threatened with death, has God deserted us? No. 
For the scripture tells us that for his sakes, we must be ready to face death at any moment of the day. We are like sheep awaiting the slaughter. But despite all this, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us enough to die for us. Hallelujah. No, there's more. He says, I am convinced that nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. Death can't. Life can't. The angels won't. And all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or if we're high in the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will be able to separate the love of God demonstrated by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he died for us. Somebody stand up and give God a shout and a thank you for his love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So if anybody ever wants proof of God's love, don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at your situation. Don't look at that negative person. You look to the cross, my friend. You look at the cross. You look to Jesus. Listen, it was the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who does that? He gave his only son so he can come into this world and die for us so that we can be saved. Jesus left the glories of heaven because of love and came into this filthy, corrupt world and took the form of a servant, the form of a man, and was obedient, even obedient to death on the cross. Who does that? Listen, it was Jesus because of love that went through everything he had to go through. Rejection and pain and death and misery. Why? Because of love, my friend. It was because of love that he went to the cross. It was because of love that he stood there and took the beating and took the scourging and the nails in his hand. Why? Because of love. And he took it all for us. He took it like a man. Every rejection, he took it like a man. Every, every time they accused him, he took it like a man. Every beating, every whipping, every scourging, he took it like a, he was a man's man. He was no sissy, he was no, he was a man's man. That's the kind of man I can follow. And he did it because of love. To redeem us. To shed his own blood. To pay the price for our ransom. To ransom us. To bring us home. To reconcile us back to the Father. So that you can be restored with your children. You can be restored with your family. Your relationships can be restored. You can be here today sitting in church in your right mind clothed in his righteousness with peace in your heart, with a joy unspeakable, with a plan and a purpose for life. We're not living life purposefully anymore. We're not living life just beating the air, hitting nothing. I mean, aiming at nothing and hitting it every time, my friend. No, we're called of God. God saved us for a purpose. God had a plan for us. Amen. And the plan for us has never been to harm us or do us evil or do us wrong. But they've been plans of peace and, and plans of hope and plans of a future. Amen. And God is getting ready to take us into the next level. God is getting ready to take us into our next promise. God is getting ready to get you into a whole new experience. But in order to step into that promise, in order to step into that encounter with God, you've got to change the way you see things. You've got to change the way you think. Your attitude, my friend. Don't allow those dominating negative attitudes to occupy your mind and keep you and hold you and keep you from moving forward, my friend. Not when God has plans for you on the other side. You have to be certain. Certain of the love of God. And certain of God's plan and purpose for your life. See, their attitude, did God bring us here to kill us? But Joshua and Caleb says, no, God didn't bring us this far to kill us. He delights in us. God loves us. And because he loves us, he will bring us into this land, which is the second key. You have to be confident of God's vision and plan for your life. Confident 
that this is the plan, that God does have a plan. See, when you don't know that, then you're going to go for every, every, everything that, that, that life and people and throw at you, my friend. But you got to be certain. I thank God that early on in my walk, sitting in the home, early on, God spoke to me. I felt the call of God. In just a few months, I knew that I knew that God called me to pastor. One day, take a city. It was clear. I thank God for that. Because that's what kept me every day when those negative things happened in the home. That's what kept me every day when I wanted to leave almost every day. I couldn't leave. You know why? Because God had a plan. And God has a purpose. That's a power of vision. That's a power of being certain, secure of God's calling upon your life, my friend. That's what kept me all these years, the call of God. The call of God. Joshua and Caleb, they were certain of the plan and the purposes of God. And then thirdly, not only certain of God's love, confident of God's plan, but thirdly, you got to know, oh, let me stay with that plan. Because when you're certain with God's plan, then it doesn't matter what stands in your way. When things happen, when things, situations come, you can't have the attitude, oh, this is a big one. Oh, I don't know. Oh, what happened, God? I don't know if I'm going to get through that. I thought you had plans for me, God. I, I thought that you, 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 you had a vision for my life. He does, my friend. In other words, it's not over. I said, it doesn't matter when you're certain, confident of God's vision and plan for you. It doesn't matter what stands between you and your promise. It could be a Red Sea, my friend. It could be a giant. It could be a lion and the bear. But it doesn't matter because you know that you know that God has plans for me. It might not look too good. It might not look so well. It might not look that there's no hope. There's no way out. It's impossible. But let me tell you something. When God has a plan for your life, it's only an obstacle. An obstacle that's an opportunity, my friend. It's only something that's standing in your way. But if God's plan for you is over there, then let me tell you something. You just look at that giant and you say giant get out of my you just look at that red sea because it's only temporary it's only for a moment it's only for a season don't think it's over god didn't bring you this far to leave you when he has planned for you over there you just in the name of the lord of hosts it's not over sometimes you think it's over but it's not over. I've been in those situations I, countless of times. I can't even count them anymore. Of times that I don't know how in the world God is going to get me through this one. I don't know how in the world God is going to provide in this way. I don't know how in the world God is going to. And I've had to just stop them. And at the moment, done. Right? The flesh gets stunned. Whoa. What's going on? And then the devil starts lying. Giving you know, all those Bible studies. And, but that's when you got to step back. Cast down those imaginations. Cast down those arguments. And step back for a moment and say, wait a minute. I've been called of God. Wait a minute. I've been chosen of God. Wait a minute. God didn't save me just to kill me. God didn't save me. God didn't bring me this far just to leave me. God, you gave me a promise. You gave me a calling. You have a purpose for my life. And right now, this giant is standing in the way. This Red Sea is standing in the way. This lion and the bear is standing in the way. But I don't look at what I see. I look to you, my God, my promise, my, my everything. And if you call me, and show me it. Let's go. We are more than able to cross over and take possession of this promise because God, you are with me. And it's only temporary. Remember that. It's only a season. How many know seasons begin and seasons end? You just hold on. I said, you just hold on, my friend. 
you just hold on, hold on. Help is on the way. God is getting ready to flex his muscles. God is getting ready to show up. God is getting ready to move. Let me tell you something. The God that I serve, the Bible says he's a mighty warrior. Hallelujah. And therefore, he's mighty in battle. There is nothing too hard for my God. There's nothing impossible for my God. And I'm his kid. I'm his son. I've been called by him. Therefore, I know he's with me. And he didn't bring me this far to leave me. It's only temporary. I don't know who God is speaking to here this morning. But we got to have the right attitude. Those that don't have the right attitude, they die in the wilderness. They never get to step into that promise and see the promise become a reality. But listen, Victory Hours, God has so much more for us. There's still so many cities to reach, so many nations to conquer, so many countries and people to be saved. God ain't finished with us. I just came back from Europe and looking at Europe there in Germany and seeing the whole rest of the nations and seeing the need out there. Let me tell you something. God ain't finished with us yet. There's still too much work to be done. But it starts right here. You got to learn how to slay your lion first. You got to learn how to trust God with that, that bear. You got to learn how then then face the Goliath, amen, and then go through your process, amen, trusting God, knowing that God has a plan so that way you can get out there and you can start walking in your destiny. You can start walking in your problem. There's no greater feel, no greater joy than to know that when you're out there and you're staking steps and you know that you're stepping and you're walking in your destiny, that this is what I was born for. This is what I was created for. This is what I was saved for. There's no greater feeling of joy and peace and fulfillment, my friend. And I don't know if we do an altar call. We just pray right there. But real quickly, let's sing a song. If God is speaking to you, I want you to come. I want you to take a step here. I want you to take that walk, that crossover, that crossover in the name of Jesus because God is getting ready to do something here. You're going to see things happen. You're going to see God.